hydrogen, magic molecule, or net zero delusion. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society, and today I'd like to talk with you about hydrogen. Is it the answer to the net zero future that so many countries and individuals are seeking and advocating for? Or are there things that we just haven't really considered in contemplating hydrogen? And this is a very important question because this week um, of August 21st, 2022, uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz is visiting Canada from Germany and apparently is going to sign some kind of a hydrogen deal with Canada for the potential to uh, supply them with some kind of energy to help Germany get off its dependency on Russian gas. Now, there are some issues with that because a liquefied natural gas is something completely different than hydrogen, which we'll discuss in this presentation. And of course, it's a situation where there is a conflict in Europe. So who knows what their actual discussions may be about. And I hope whatever they are, that they're fruitful in terms of possibly coming to a closure on the conflicts that threaten all of Europe, all of the world, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And sadly, tragically, many people are dying and suffering terribly because of it. And I do want to discuss later on how the people in Germany will be suffering because of the energy crisis. And honestly, that doesn't take away at all from the terrible tragedy going on in the Ukraine. So please don't misunderstand the purpose of this discussion. It's about energy. So let's go on with the presentation here and see what we have to say. Now, today we're going to be relying on uh, information from some European experts. But first, let's contemplate what's going on here. Reuters is reporting that Germany Schultz to sign hydrogen deal on Canada trip and discuss LNG. So then it says separately the Chancellor is set to meet with representatives of Canada pension funds to discuss possible investments in Germany linked to its green transition, the official said. Well, I hope all you pension funds read this before investing because there's no green transition going on and um, pension fund beneficiaries should read it too. So let's set a little bit of context here. Canada-Germany re trade relations, um, they're pretty good. Um, and you can see that Canada is much, much bigger than Germany. But in terms of economies, Germany is the largest economy in the US, EU, <clears throat> excuse me, and the fourth largest in the world, and is a key economic partner for Canada. We have a strong, diverse commercial relationship, uh, six largest trading partner globally with two-way merchandise of 25.9 billion. Canadian exports to Germany were 6.9 billion and our imports from Germany were 19 billion. So we have a very strong relationship here. Also, uh, Germany-Canada services trade, including travel and tourism, about 5.4 billion in 2021. <coughs> Germany is also the seventh largest foreign investor in Canada and fourth among European countries with a stock of direct investment valued at $32 billion at the end of 2020. So um, there's lots of important ties that we have with Germany, and it's in our interest to try and help them out however we can. But let's ask some European energy experts about hydrogen. Uh, we're going to be reviewing some of the commentaries of Samuel Ferfari. This little book is available in English and in French. We're going to be looking at commentary from uh, Jorgen Hemmingsen, uh, who was a former EU energy advisor. And we'll also look at the work of Henrik Dominanski uh, from uh, the EU, um, who's talking about the safety issues associated with um, the use of hydrogen in public context. Now, first of all, for clarity, the world runs on oil, natural gas, and coal. So this is from the BP Statistical Review of June 2020. It really hasn't changed much. 
And it's important to notice that those who expect to eliminate fossil fuels expect this little segment of renewables to replace coal, natural gas, and oil. And they expect it to happen in the next eight or ten years. So let's look at what powers Germany. This is from the International Energy Agency. And you can see here that it's coal, natural gas, nuclear. This very thin little yellow line is wind and solar. Uh, biofuels and waste is kind of a fatter line here. And oil is the big orange one. So looks a lot like how the world runs. And for clarity, Energiewende is a fantasy. And you can see here, this is the natural gas component of energy supply in Germany today. Um, that's not replaceable overnight by anything. So the problem that we face today is that there is a global energy crisis and there is a conflict in the Ukraine. And you can see in this amazing map from National Geographic the oil and gas pipelines from Russia into Europe. So Germany and many European countries are reliant on natural gas, oil and or coal from Russia. Until the outbreak of conflict in the Ukraine, this commercial arrangement worked well, but a combination of divestment campaigns, which reduces energy supply, the COVID industrial rebound demand, international sanctions imposed on Russia due to the conflict, and Russia's constraint on natural gas delivery to the EU, especially Germany, all this threatens German industry, the economy, and it puts the public at risk of heat or eat poverty. <clears throat> now, ironically, tragically, the EU is effectively financing the war against Ukraine. Because uh, something like 600 million euros are going to, the, uh, to Russia every day uh, in payments for gas imports. So natural gas is very important. Let's have a look at the countries that produce and the countries that consume natural gas. And some of these countries only consume so I guess, um, you know, for, for Canadians, it's kind of hard to imagine that lots of countries in the world just don't have fossil fuels. They just don't have them. They have to import most of them or all of them from somewhere else. Um, and in good times, that's okay. You can make decent trade arrangements and everything's fine. But in bad times, when energy spikes, it becomes a huge problem for the economy of that country uh, because it's, the economy is reliant on energy to make other things and sell to other countries. But uh, suddenly the cost of making those things skyrockets because of the cost of the imported energy skyrocketing. So these are some of the complications that Germany and other EU countries are facing right now. So if we look closer at this list, I know the type is quite fine, but you can see that the top 10 countries that produce the most natural gas are United States, Russia, Iran, China, Qatar, Canada, we're in sixth place, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Norway, and Algeria. <laughs> but the top 10 that consume the most, well, it's not quite a match, is it? United States, Russia, China, Iran, Canada, Saudi Arabia, and then we have Japan and Germany, Mexico and the United Kingdom taking up the last few spots here. And they're consuming very substantial amounts. Now, of course, uh, Japan is quite an industrialized economy as well. And uh, they really have very limited um, fossil fuel resources. And so the top 10 countries with the largest natural gas reserves, well, Russia. <laughs> Iran, Qatar, Turkmenistan, United States, China, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, United Emirates, and Nigeria. So those are countries that other countries will be interested in. 
and let's have a look at who's importing and who's exporting. Now we're talking here about liquefied natural gas which is a pressurized and liquefied form of natural gas so it can be shipped worldwide. Um, as we saw in the map back here, let me just go back in this map we see gas pipelines and the gas pipelines which are in green here uh, they simply need to have compressor stations that push the gas down the pipeline to the ultimate destination um, which may be some storage facilities but the gas doesn't actually have to be liquefied in order to be moved so liquefied natural gas is a more complex and somewhat more expensive process but it is a very substantial industry worldwide. So we see the leading exporting countries of liquefied natural gas or LNG, Australia, Qatar, United States, Russia. Now we saw that Russia was uh, a major exporter, but here for LNG, they're not one of the biggest exporters. Um, Malaysia, Nigeria, Algeria, Indonesia, Oman, and Papua New Guinea, surprising to me, and leading importing countries, and again, they're not the same. China, Japan, South Korea, India, Taiwan, Spain, France, United Kingdom, Turkey, Pakistan. Of course, when I say they're not the same, what I mean is that they're geographically separate, they um, have high demands. Look, the demand in China is greater than the export of Australia, for instance. Um, but China is not a significant producer of LNG. So, and Japan isn't at all because they don't have those resources. They have to import everything. And the LNG market is highly comp competitive. So as I said before, to ship natural gas it has to be cooled, compressed, and liquefied. That's how you get those little initials, LNG, and gas delivery via pipeline does not need this process. So the top U.S. LNG destinations are France, Spain, the U.K., Netherlands, South Korea, Belgium, Turkey, Japan, Taiwan, Portugal, India, and Singapore. And you can see in these times, uh, liquid ni liquefied natural gas is so... Uh, much in demand that this uh, LNG vessel is has been sent on a mission to one destination but in the middle of its trip it had to make an abrupt U-turn in the Pacific Ocean to take advantage of a more attractive price arbitrage in Europe and had to go right back through the Panama Canal so it's very competitive out there very cutthroat right now now in Canada as soon as this was announced that um, Germany was interested in LNG from Canada, this foreign-funded environmental group said Canadian LNG for Germany is a no-go because of climate change and stranded assets. So this group is called the International Institute for Sustainable Development. It's a Canadian charity, and we'll see more about it a bit later on. But at least they do have this very good um, illustration here. So gas comes from the gas field, the impurities are extracted, it's liquefied, it's transferred to a tank, and it's loaded on an LNG transport tanker. And then this goes across the ocean, it has to unload in a similar kind of facility, transferring to a tank. Then that liquefied natural gas has to be turned back into gas, and then pushed through the transport network. Now Canada has one LNG import facility, Canaport in St. John, New Brunswick, um, and there have been many LNG export facilities proposed and approved over the last decade, and then they claim due to low LNG prices and inability to access finance, nearly all have been cancelled or postponed. Yeah, right, that's um, actually, they were, most of them were um, cancelled or postponed because of changes in climate policy legislation because of vehement activism by all kinds of foreign funded activists in Canada and because of our crazy kind of loosey-goosey climate change rules now where companies say you know what 
it sounds like we could spend billions of dollars getting this approved only to get to the end of the line and have some obscure uh, stakeholder pop up from no one, nowhere and say, I don't want this going through. And they'd go, okay, we're going to block you then. So a lot of investment has run away from Canada because of this. And a lot of these facilities have been cancelled because of this kind of activism and because our our uh, climate policies and energy policies now have been deemed to be hostile to investment. That's what PPHP Energy Bankers of Houston said in April 2018. Hostile to investment. So that's not good. We'll press on here. And ironically, Germany has no LNG terminals. So even if Canada had an, uh, a viable LNG export option, um, they don't have any receiving terms. Because <clears throat> once you fill up this tanker and you send it somewhere, once it gets there, it has to be able to unload. Um, <laughs> and at this point, Germany hasn't got any of those terminals at all. So based on these complex geopolitical and supply chain factors, why not hydrogen as a replacement energy source for Germany? In theory, hydrogen produced from wind and solar becomes like a battery. So the idea is that when there's excess wind or solar, you can send it to the grid. You can use it as an electrolyzer to split and create hy uh, hydrogen because it has to be made, manufactured. Then you can um, pump it into storage. And then later, you can use it to drive a turbine. Um, so that all sounds great, except all the way along the line, you lose energy. So you're losing energy. And that's why Professor Samuel Fafari calls it, in practice, hydrogen is a strategy to nowhere. And he even goes so far as to say, often in life when we do one thing wrong, we do another in order to hide the first. That is what happens with hydrogen. It's appalling to see the green stubbornness and indoctrination which the European politicians have fallen. So what he sees is that hydrogen sort of promises real free energy. That's the pitch from environmental groups and climate activists. But even back in 2013, Germany was facing energy poverty because they had instituted so much reckless expansion of wind and solar has come with a hefty price tag for consumers. And uh, we found in our studies that wind and solar, um, depending on the territory, will either triple power rates or drive them up nine times as much. Now, it's important to recognize also that wind is primarily backed up by natural gas. So you need natural gas to make your wind and solar useful because natural gas is a fuel that can like quite easily ramp up and down just like you would with a gas stove. You know, when you want to uh, saute something, you can turn the heat down a little bit. When you want to boil something, you can turn the gas jets up. Uh, that kind of ramping is very important when you have a lot of wind and solar on the grid and Germany has tons of it. So the cost of gas and the lack of delivery supply um, must be wreaking havoc with their grid and their power prices. It's a really a very complicated situation there. And why has this happened? Well, it's probably because people were listening to futurists like Jeremy Rifkin rather than engineers like Professor Samuel Ferfari. And this man is named one of the most 150 most influential people in the U.S. that have the most influence in shaping federal government policy. And he's served as an advisor to various global leaders, including Nicolas Sarkozy of France and Angela Merkel of Germany. Wow. <laughs> and it even says in Euroactive that the Third Industrial Revolution arguably provided the blueprint for Germany's transition to a low-carbon economy. And you can see here he also wrote this book, The Hydrogen Economy. Um, 
So uh, Germany's uh, low carbon economy is a disaster right now. Uh, so if that's the blueprint that they've been following, they should throw it out and bring Professor Fafari back in for a chat. So Professor Fafari is an energy expert. He's a professor emeritus, a chemical engineer, and author of these books. He himself worked on um, trying to make hydrogen into a viable uh, fuel source for many decades. Um, and in his Amazon description here, he discusses why he's written this book. And he's quite disappointed, <clears throat> excuse me, he's quite disappointed that my former employer suddenly decided to discard its officials and European re researchers' 50 years' experience and know how and have embarked on a dead end road just because it's politically correct trendy and there's money to spend. Sound public policy should be scientifically correct, effective, well thought out, and mindful of public funds. So he goes on to talk about the fact that you know there's going to be lots of subsidies available so this just will draw in all of the green crony capitalists but at the expense of the public which is the last thing we need now when everyone's already broke. And uh, amusingly from his book, <laughs> he attended this 2006 session with uh, Jeremy Rifkin and he couldn't believe what he was hearing. This is a picture of, his, of the look on Samuel Ferfari's face, <laughs> like what? And just to give you an idea of what, um, what he said, uh, Rifkin presents slogans that are charming, humanistic, and emotional utopias. Let us quote him. Now this is from Samuel Fafari's book. I think it's quite hilarious if it wasn't so sad. In the hydrogen economy, with its centralized and democratized energy web, it's possible to establish human settlements, bioregions, ecoregions, and georegions that reflect the settlement patterns of the many biochemical communities of the Earth itself. Embedding human communities into bio communities creates a deep new sense of security that is indivisible from the Earth's own health and well being. Oh, really? <laughs> but that's just not how um, hydrogen works. There's this tremendous problem of energy loss, and this is by Jorgen Henningsen who was a part of the European Commission for almost 20 years, first as Director of the Environment and from 2001 as a Principal advi uh, Advisor to DG Environment. And he says, the explanation is quite simple. Conversion of electricity, green or not, that's referring to the type of hydrogen made, into hydrogen implies a loss of plus or minus 30% of the energy content of electricity. And whatever subsequent step taken in making the hydrogen into practical use will imply another 30% loss of the 70% energy remaining in the hydrogen. Altogether, leaving us with plus or minus half the energy in the original electricity being available for useful purposes. So that's not what we want to do with energy. Now, let's look at energy density. Energy density is the amount of energy that can be released by a given mass or volume of fuel. And if you look at this chart, it looks like, wow, holy mackerel, methane and hydrogen would be the best. But as they say here, although methane and hydrogen both have higher energy density than gasoline, their gaseous form creates storage difficulties. Furthermore, Hydrogen must be synthesized, which requires energy. So that's why it's a no-go. Now, hydrogen is the smallest molecule, and it has some very interesting qualities. It, uh, when it's in a, a conventional pipe, like steel pipe or such like, 
it actually embrittles the metal and so it makes the metal very brittle and and it because it's a small molecule it actually of course can sneak out now it's invisible and it doesn't have a scent uh, so when it is sneaking out through the metal that movement can cause static energy which in turn can ignite the hydrogen and it has an invisible flame and it's also very explosive so the blast range of hydrogen is about a football field in layman's terms so it's a very complex substance to handle it has to be extremely highly pressurized and um, the casing inside whatever um, cell that you're putting it has to be immune to it uh, getting out and and those kinds of metals are very expensive so it becomes a very expensive way to store energy that was made in an expensive way to begin with that incorporated many energy losses along the way so that's not an optimal optimal source of energy in any sense of the word now a lot of climate activists of course are on the bandwagon for hydrogen <clears throat> this is from the natural resources defense council out of the states they don't think there's a problem with hydrogen safety so this uh, goes through it and talks about their point of view but um, an engineer went through and and cross-referenced a few points here so they say that hydrogen has a lower radiant heat than conventional gasoline but the rebuttal is that the flame temperature is irrelevant what's important is that hydrogen flames are colorless and so can persist without detection and uh, says um, that uh, hydrogen has higher oxygen requirements for explosion than fossil fuels but the engineer says oxygen levels are irrelevant as in the real world it mixes with air as previously stated the level of explosion of hydrogen is 4% to 75% this is significantly wider uh, for example, will explode more readily than gasoline, which is at 1.4% to 7.6%, or natural gas, which is at 5% to 15%. And over here, the uh, engineer says hydrogen is much more prone to leaks from vessels and piping in homes because people are advocating for hydrogen for home heating. Leaks are more likely to occur, causing hydrogen to concentrate in the building quickly reaching explosive mixture in cars leaks will correct collect in garages and park car parkades causing substantial risk so the explosive level of hydrogen is four percent to seventy five percent it's very wide and very explosive um, some of that is sort of engineering jargon that people might not get but all you need to understand is that it's very explosive. It's not meant for civilian handling. And this is a commentary by um, Henrik Dominovsky. He's a hazardous materials, explosive hazardous materials expert. And his view is that pushing hydrogen out of the safety control laboratory environment for mass on-road application will cause critical safety hazards. You know, and we've seen, um, I mean, uh, I find it very annoying because we see people like Mark Carney kind of breezily saying, oh, you know, they're already mixing hydrogen and they're going to be piping it and there's no problem. Well, in some industrial applications, that's true it is already piped and used in a certain way in a certain mixture with other gases but um, that's in an industrial setting which is very strictly monitored there's safety protocols in place 
and it's for industrial application. You can't take that same thing and apply it to a home context or to a personal car context and hope that the results will be good when you're dealing with such uh, an exceptionally unique molecule. So what else does he say? He says, um, <clears throat> Nowadays, hydrogen is blithely promoted by influential persons like Mark Carney and thus is considered a carbon-free energy vector solution with little to no consideration that this tiniest molecule is in its artificially separated status one of the most difficult and dangerous substances to handle on Earth. The engineering community acknowledges this fact and treats hydrogen carefully. However, to distribute hydrogen to millions of untrained customers, such as vehicle owners, seems a perilous idea. He goes on to say that industrial level standards are not possible in civil society. Hydrogen is used in industry, chemical, not energy, at, uh, where strict regulations, expert knowledge and strict handling protocols are in place. Even so, there are accidents. But by contrast, the non-industrial societal environment is unlike the industrial one. For dozens of reasons, the risks associated with hydrogen in the non-industrial environment are not controllable and precautions are futile. Hydrogen is a unique molecule. There's no order, odor and no color. So you can't even see when there's a flame. And Consequently, the common human senses that warn us of a dangerous situation, sight, smell, and sound, are useless in dealing with a hydrogen leak. Only industrial quality instrument monitoring is suitable, but this is far too expensive and complex for mass consumer application. And ultimately, Germany doesn't need hydrogen. If they want, they could make their own. Germany needs natural gas. Germany is an industrial power, supplies the world with critical chemicals and products. This is from BASF's Ludwig Schaffen site. There are 29,000 employees at this site. It's got an area of about 10 square kilometers and the world's largest integrated chemical complex. So it's a huge employer. In the world, they employ over 100,000 employees in the BASF group. And they produce all kinds of materials that all of us use every day. Chemicals, materials, industrial solutions, surface technologies, nutrition and care, agricultural solutions. So it's a huge, huge company. But sadly, because of the natural gas shortage, they were about to they may have to shut down operations and, and they announced this back in April. So natural gas provides energy for heat, it provides the energy for thermal processes, electricity generation and a stream of useful products and also natural gas as propane can be used to power vehicles. So this is from the uh, First Nations LNG Alliance in Canada but they're just giving you an idea of all the many different things made from natural gas. So these are some of the things that uh, would be part of the Ludwig Schaffen product stream. Now this is a Google translation uh, from German. So you can go to the link and see the original story if you like. But what's happened is apparently foreign funding of climate activists in Germany um, has led to the disastrous climate policies that they now have now. Let's put them in this energy bind. So more details are becoming known about the financial dependence of the Schwerin Climate and Environmental Protection Foundation um, on the Russian state-owned company Gazprom. So apparently they've received about 200 million euros from Gazprom and they have been agitating for the very policies that have put Germany in this quandary. And a similar thing is happening here in Canada. Surprise, surprise. I'm going to go back to that group, the International um, Institute for Sustainable Development. It's a federally registered charity, charity in Canada. As soon as the announcement of potentially supplying 
LNG to uh, Europe and Germany came up, boom, they issued this report saying, no, no, it's not the answer. So I looked at their revenue on the Canada Revenue Agency site. I found that they get government funding of $7 million, uh, which was 28% of their revenues. But their other revenues were $18 million, or 7092 and of that, $17 million non-tax receipted revenue from all sources outside Canada. Government and non-government. So who's actually funding these guys to block economic development? And their claims are similar. In Germany, <clears throat> In Germany, the climate activists claimed, oh, we don't want to have LNG terminals because that would lock in a fossil fuel future, and we're going to be off fossil fuels any time now, and you don't want to have stranded assets. It would just be a waste of public funds. Better to put that money into wind and solar. And what do we see in Canada? Well, <laughs> exact same kind of baloney. High prices and energy con security concerns combined with climate commitments suggest that new Canadian liquefied natural gas infrastructure would be at risk of becoming stranded. Well, that's all a myth. And you can read this report by Robert Lyman. Um, so it's the same kind of mythology that these climate activists funded by Gazprom in Germany are pushing on Germany. And, you know, ironically, no one in Canada seems to be concerned about this. So, if you recall, uh, when the trucker convoy, the Freedom Convoy, was in Ottawa, Mark Carney claimed that it was time to end sedition with Ottawa by enforcing the law and following the money. And in this op-ed in the Globe and Mail, he claimed that there was foreign influence, foreign money. If you recall, uh, CBC suggested that Russia was behind the Freedom Convoy. Um, and then banks were asked to freeze the accounts of Freedom Convoy protesters. And it turned out that people actually had been mostly Canadians donating, you know, 20 to $100, no big money. <laughs> and yet none of these ENGOs that are receiving millions of dollars from foreign entities, none of them have ever been debanked. And no one even asks any questions. And yet, the foreign influence via ENGOs is blocking economic development and jobs and driving the global energy crisis. And ironically, meanwhile, Russia never bought into climate change hysteria. Okay? So the rest of the world is doing backflips, trying to meet climate targets. Meanwhile, since the Kyoto Protocol, Russia has seen uh, climate change activism as an assault on economic growth, the environment, public safety, science, and human civilization itself. And one of their premier scientists, Habibulo Abdusautov, claims that we are now going into a new little ice age due to the drop in solar activity. And this was published quite some time ago, I think uh, 20... Um, I can't see... Mm -hmm. 2010 maybe? 2013? Anyway, um, so are, are we just shooting ourselves in the foot while Russia laughs all the way to the bank? So ultimately, I would say that most Canadians would love to supply Germany and the world with LNG. And you can see in this great image by the visual capitalists, some of the um, comparative images of who's the biggest suppliers of natural gas and here we are we have a pretty good chunk of the pie there uh, so it's a shame that we're not able to exploit it due to activism climate activism in Canada so that's the presentation on hydrogen is it a magic molecule or a net zero delusion I think you probably know by now it's a delusion even though hydrogen will remain an important niche market and a very important for manu and very important for manufacturing fertilizer, but it's not a magic molecule to create a low carbon society. So I invite you to read our two-part report. This came out um, uh, 
just after the throne speech of a couple of years ago, uh, but it's still valid. The first part looks at the geopolitics um, and why we shouldn't copy other countries' climate policies. And this um, goes through the bridge to the future and the five bold moves of the Gerald Butts task force and shows what works and what doesn't. And this is a bit about us. Um, it's our view that the sun is the main driver of climate change, not you and not CO2. So in fact, none of these uh, gymnastics about um, energy are necessary if, if our position is correct. Um, you know, that's not to say that, that um, we should not continue with innovations. It's not to discredit any of the uh, new forms of energy technologies that are being developed, but um, a lot of these appear to be sort of venture capital efforts to um, pump and dump stock, if you like, and uh, to cash in on subsidies to create regulatory environments where normal energy, conventional energy systems and companies have a lot of trouble operating to make it impossible for them to operate really. And what that does, it, it offloads the entire burden of all the subsidies onto the consumers. And uh, these non-performers get off scot-free. Uh, so over the next while, there's still going to be kind of a rolling freight train of, of subsidy consequences hitting Canadians and people around the world. Any, any country that's gone into Green New Deal type of offerings or net zero plans, all the taxpayers are going to be crushed by these crazy policies. And again, the problem is that climate activists and ideologues, futurists, are driving the conversation and not engineers and professional scientists who would demand a full cost-benefit analysis and would require performance parameters that would meet the needs of society. That's the whole purpose of having professional engineers, you know, <laughs> and yet we're not making the best of their excellent knowledge in these endeavors. So if you also read uh, the work of uh, Clintel, you'll see that over a thousand scientists and scholars have stated that there's no climate emergency and there's no urgency. We do have time. So there's no need to turn the world upside down and force these clean tech policies on citizens or markets. So um, please have a look at Clintel. Please have a look at our reports and uh, get in touch. If you're a pension fund beneficiary, get in touch with your pension fund and demand accountability on these things. You can't keep investing in things that don't work and things that cost you more money than they deliver in productive benefit to society. So that's my little rant for today. I hope it was informative and feel free to contact us. Please leave some comments below then we can have a look and respond to your concerns. And um, you can also send us an email if you have questions and I'll be posting the PowerPoint on our blog with the video so that you can go through and click on the links as you may see fit. I thank you very much for joining me and uh, for Friends of Science Society. I'm Michelle Sterling.